Welcome to the Mr. Beacon podcast. This week we've got Amir Koshniati, who is the Vice President and General Manager of IoT at Identive. So uh, Amir is someone that actually has been on the show before, uh, and uh, he is uh, a veteran of the RFID business of NFC. So we'll be talking to him about what Identive are doing as a manufacturer of tags, smart tags, in ambient IoT, but also uh, what they do in other areas. And um, I first came across Identive six years ago, was really intrigued because they deal with highly sophisticated uh, custom requirements, as well as producing large numbers of, uh, of tags. And um, Willio uses, uh, leverages that uh, capacity and um, has a partnership. So um, this is going to be a Willio influenced episode, um, but I am going to ask him to compare and contrast uh, the pros and cons of optical, of barcodes, uh, QR codes, NFC, RFID, and BLE. So a lot of acronyms, but if you're an architect of solutions and you want to make sure you're using the right th technology for the right task, then this is the episode for you. Amir, welcome back to the Mr. Beacon podcast. Thank you for having me, Steve. Well, two years have gone by, a lot's changed. Uh, you are heading up an IoT division at uh, Identive. So um, maybe we should start off with just explaining a bit about um, Identive, the company, and then, then I'll follow up and ask you some questions about what you're doing in uh, in the whole IoT area. So who are I I Identive? I, I know it's a company that I came across when I first started working at Williot and you were like these um, gurus of the RFID world, uh, you know, really uh, um, adept at complex integrations, complex technology. Um, how do you explain who Identive are when, uh, when you're meeting people for the first time? Well, I summarize it very quickly into engineering excellence on uh, specialized IoT solutions. Now, if I go a layer deeper, there, there's obviously, obviously much more substance behind that. But um, what really pulled me over to, to Identif to really come in and then start to project it forward from a traditional transponder business into an IoT business was that level of engineering excellence and how we separate ourselves as a full end-to-end -end provider of specialty solutions. So a lot of the market traditionally with RFID is focused on UHF solutions. So one reader to many different tags in an environment. Very commoditized, usually standard SKUs that you're running on a very efficient volume basis. Uh, identity, uh, identity isn't positioned to really operate in that manner. We're positioned to figure out the complex applications in adverse environments and then put ourselves in a situation to build secret sauce around these applications so they could be really sticky long-term business. And we don't really worry about the volumes. We worry about the specialized uh, expertise that we put behind each product. So the history has been uh, traditional. Uh, HF, NFC has been the foundation of the business. And we've started to really evolve that into true IoT solutions. Uh, we, we work very close, obviously, with Williot, with the BLEs, and we've gotten into also active technologies. So things with printed electronics, printed batteries, things that go into PCB boards. But name of the game for us is specialized products and level of engineering that goes into them to really work and find those specialized solutions for our customers. So if someone needs a custom tag, they're integrating it into uh, an auto injector or something like that. That's the kind of stuff that you do? Absolutely. Uh, we like taking it one layer deeper. So it's not just a recognition of the SKU information. We like to get into the condition monitoring. We like to get into additional capabilities as you work up the ladder set versus just the basic, here's authentication, here's your product information, and you're, you're off and running. We want to create those digital triggers that on an ongoing basis feed data and then allow our 
customers essentially to do data mining and go go much much further with what we provide. So you sell off the shelf products. I've browsed through your website. You've got a lot of different SKUs, uh, but you're also up for custom uh, uh, development work. Um, is it? It's beyond just the hardware and the tags, though, isn't it? It's uh, what I what I'm seeing you doing is making moves into the cloud too. Can you expand on that? Sure. So, so the basis of the business is we we do provide tags. So we we have our custom proprietary antennas. We do the manufacturing, the chip attaches, and complex applications. Also, capacitor attachments on the same line. We have secondary processes that do the converting as well. So if we want to do any kind of laminates, prints, adhesives, we can do that. And we do the encoding. And then how we bring it all home is really the level of encoding and serialization and being able to manage it top down from the cloud. We work very well with a lot of partners like Williot, like Collect IDs, TapWows of the world. But we recently launched uh, almost about a year ago our Bitsy.io cloud, which is really three different modules. One, it has... Tag management allows us when we are deploying tags into the market to commission and decommission tags from the cloud. And when we do typically provide our products in a role or some level of a real format, you can take that information directly from the cloud versus an Excel document that is pretty static in most cases. We have a second module that's geared for marketing teams to really roll their sleeves up and build consumer experiences behind what they interact with, with these digitized products. And the third module, which is my, I guess, most exciting feature set of this cloud is that we've actually built the foundation on Tableau. So all of the data that gets summoned up to the cloud, you can do data mining and you can mix and match that data and make more informed decisions based on what the tags are doing in the market. So whether you're working with RFID solutions uh, or BLE solutions or a combination of both, the cloud supports that, and it's a very nice plug-in for all our partner clouds as well. So are you um, competing with people in the application space, or is this more uh, middleware and management? Right now, we've built it in a way that it's a, it's a middleware, so it acts as a tunnel, and it can pass the information along. Um, there are modules that we could say do overlap with partners in some degree, so it's, it's really a... Uh, right level of an agreement that we get into in many different engagements to say that these partners have an expertise, let's say in specialty retail for uh, garments or jerseys or luxury items. So for them, if that's their niche, we let them play there and we focus on the tag delivery, we focus on the serialization and we focus on a level of tag management. And if they'd like us to get into the marketing experiences, we can do that or we just relay the information at that point in time to them and let them handle the consumer experience portion. And the data can come from both sets, the encoding information, and it can come from us or them afterwards based on the engagements their consumers have. So we built it with the flexibility that it can work as a plug and play with partners. But the biggest thing that we wanted to provide our customers with without uh, outside of just the data management was the ability that when we deliver products, you have the power to understand everything we've commissioned to you. And if for some reason you have to recall something or there's an issue on the on the assembly line, you can go back to the cloud and do your decommissioning. And so you're not at the mercy of going back to the reel and figuring out what you've unraveled from that reel, what has been deployed, and manually going through the process. And there's a lot of value in being able to do that from the cloud. I think uh, this is really interesting in two respects. Uh, one is... It seems to me that the original paradigm with RFID, UHF RFID, which was really uh, starting to scale before the cloud was even invented, uh, um, certainly wasn't in the same place that it is now. And data, you know, you thought of the data being all of it was encoded into the tag and you were worried about what the capacity of the tag was and did it have enough bytes and and what you're doing with the cloud removes that concern. You're essentially building a digital product passport in the cloud, which could be huge. You could have video and uh, all sorts of uh, cold chain history in the cloud. Um, and really, the, the the tag is simplified. It's a sensor and it's a uh, 
it's an identifier. So that's my that's one of my takes on, on what you've just said. Is that in line with your view, or do, do you have a different one, a different view of it? No, that that's absolutely it. We 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 want to really ride the uh, the tailwind behind a lot of the mandates, like the digital passport that right now is uh, being enforced in in Europe. So this definitely meets that requirement because you're at the front of the supply chain. You're providing the digital trigger that gets married into a product or on top of a product if it's a package, and you're able to get that traceability and the validity really from inception all the way to where the product ends up and hopefully goes through the sustainable routes and goes through uh, the, the circular economy based on what those mandates are. But in the same respect, because we're a specialty provider on the IoT side, there's a lot of value in being able to track that and track that with the capabilities of condition monitoring behind it. So this foundation that we've built and the way that it works with partner platforms allows for all of that. And it's it's been very exciting and it's been a very good early stage launch. Now we're looking to get into the uh, additional capabilities and, and really keep up with the suppliers on their uh, latest and greatest chips. So your running this uh, this team with Ed Identiv. Um, and you know the second area that I think is in, uh, kind of an interesting implication is the the move to SaaS business models um, uh, where you know it used to be people made the tags, they sold them, that was it. It was kind of a one-off transaction. And so you had this incentive to essentially try and get people to spend as much on the tag as as, as possible. Which you know, from my perspective, always you know that represents friction. Uh, it's like if you get all the money up front, whether they use it or not, um, then you know it's great for you as the vendor, but maybe not so much for uh, for them. Who knows if they're going to use it a lot or a little or not at all? Um, so it seems like by having a SaaS business model, you have a bit more flexibility. You can get more aggressive on the on the tag price and have more of a success based re- recurring uh, business model um you know how much are you as the, as the as the guy that's running this this group how much are you looking at um building recurring revenue uh and and well let, let's just start off with that question i have another question to ask you ask as well sure, sure, sure. Do you, are you are you okay. focused on building your SaaS revenue stream is that part of your strategy absolutely and we are a public company so that 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 uh topic is a very uh very sensitive one because we we definitely want that and that part of the business is great builds a lot of stability for for our uh, trajectory forward now uh i don't think it's an immediate model to supersede the hardware side and the tag side uh, when I'm looking specifically into 2024, but as you're starting to progress forward from, let's say, a projection of, of five years out, uh, we are a specialty provider. So I think that secret sauce helps us from price erosion when it comes to the hardware side, because we're adding value add services on top of traditional RFID. And we are never going to be in the commodity game. We're never going to be in the retail game when it comes to those levels of billions of tags in the market. But where we do see value is that we will see a time that it might be better to give the complete package as one. And when you do give the complete package as one, you're able to put the tags, blend it into the cloud cost, and many times even forego the tag cost. So you're giving essentially the tags away for free, and you're monetizing it based on your results in the cloud and your engineering excellence to go out to the field and actually deploy a solution. And that's where the trajectory and the excitement for our engineering excellence really is, is that we've mastered it internally in making world-class products that our customers really can rely on in all these adverse environments. But then the next step is, okay, now we're getting the data out of it. How do we make it digestible for the customers? And then how do we get closer with the customers that that engineering excellence isn't just within our four walls, it actually lives on site in their actual manufacturing environment or their distribution environment and guiding them to the right solutions that when we deploy, it's efficient, doesn't become a bottleneck in their process, and they're realizing the real-time benefits from from the data side. Very good. So can you 
clarify a bit more what the boundaries are of what your team does versus the rest of Identive? What's your role? What's your team's role? How does it differ from the rest of Identive? And you know, what was the mandate that you were given when you when you joined the company? Sure. Yeah. There's really two pillars to Identive. The, the, the first one is the traditional foundation of the business, which is the access control company. They work with uh, many high-end customers, including government customers. They do everything from the access control devices that go on the doors, uh, the infrastructure with uh, how it works behind the scenes with the video surveillance, uh, all the analytics and data behind it. They have good training uh, programs as well and training teams. And then also the cart business as well. It interacts with the access car, access uh, units to get in and out of the building. So everything end to end is that pillar of that business unit within Identity. The other business unit is a historic transponder uh, unit, which I came in uh, and we've been growing the team around. And my mandate was really to come in, grow the business, and then also start to build uh, much more of a global footprint. So historically, we had a very good footprint in the US. Uh, what we've done essentially over the last two years is we've diversified our reach really globally. And we have a very good footprint as well right now, I would say in Europe, in many cases, even growing the business uh, even more uh, compared to the other regions. And then in addition to that, we have transformed specifically over the last 12 months from a traditional RFID company being focused on HF and NFC to a true IoT company. And that's the excitement trajectory for our future is we've went from basic technologies in HF NFC with some level of specialization to a true IoT company, leveraging the same engineering resources, leveraging the same machines that we use to produce the traditional products. And now we're even getting into some value add services. And those value add services are the specializations on the converting some very, very uh, finite specialization on the encoding. So as you get into higher encrypted uh, tax, tags and mandates around security, we're able to lock those tags in a way that nobody else is doing. And then now we're getting in the cloud business as well. So building Bitsy.io, being able to manage it truly puts us in a position as an IoT end-to-end -end provider. And really those are the two pillars under IDENF. So a little bit... Uh, I would say it's some small overlaps when you look at NFC technology and cards, but really you draw a fine line between the two and you say, okay, this is more of an access control business that they call premises. And then you have our group, which is identity and then the IoT business. Very good. And maybe let's talk a bit about what you're doing with Williot. Uh, I always try and I'm kind of a bit reticent to do that uh, because this is, uh, uh, I try and take a, an independent view here, but I can't get over it because I think you're doing some interesting stuff with ambient IoT. Um, and uh, Williot's known for battery-free Bluetooth. Uh, and I, I know, uh, so we've been collaborating, we've been quite public about the fact that you've been making large numbers of battery-free Bluetooth, Bluetooth tags based on the Williot chip. Um, and even though people think of Williot as a, as a, a IoT tag, a Bluetooth tag company, we actually don't make the tags. It's companies like like yours that that make them. But tell us a bit about what you're doing with with batteries and and our product because that's not something that we even talk about on our website, but it's something that you do talk about on yours. And so people might be a bit confused and. Uh, and basically, we decided we didn't want to confuse people. We're fully committed. We think there's a massive, the biggest part of the opportunity is battery free. But there are use cases where batteries are, uh, are valuable. Perhaps you can talk about what you're, you're doing in that space. Yeah, definitely. And, and we're in a very privileged position to be working with Williot on, on both ends. And we see the future. We see the, the dream of ambient IoT picking up. I think everybody else does as well. Um, and we're there. Uh, the technology is there. Uh, it's just a matter of the building notoriety and even more awareness around it. So we have the passive side that uh, we've, we've been building on. But one thing that I think was really exciting, and it was almost maybe even two years ago, if I'm getting my timing right, was the, uh, the BAT product, the battery-assisted pixel, was first announced from our side. I think we were, uh, we may have done it at NRF, if I'm not mistaken. 
And um, we announced it and everybody was wondering, well, what is this? And how did you get to a $1 to $2 price point on something that traditionally the market had seen at best case between $5 to $10? And that was never a sure thing. And um, the reality is we're, we're there. Um, we have some really nice pilots right now with a lot of prominent names. And um, what it really is, is our ability to take the same condition monitoring that comes with an active logger, set the intervals, and then start to work much closer to an item level type application, which the cold chain market historically has always struggled with. So when you look at a lot of, uh, so, so healthcare, pharmaceuticals, medical devices that need some condition monitoring and ongoing uh, data marks to make sure the compliance aspects are being met. In many cases, are having a budget for something like this in a logger that's much higher. But the ones that really aren't are under the food segment. Um, going in at an item level on a lead of, a lead, a lettuce head doesn't always work out all too well. So we've, we've had a history to work at pallet level, at crate level, and our ambition is to start to go towards the item levels. And the experience has been uh, positive. It's been positive to show a logger that is now smaller in dimensions. And I think we had a webinar where we went through the technical specifications behind it. Um, and then in the same respect, being able to produce these on the same lines that we're doing our traditional RFID products also is very exciting. So we're not building new processes on the manufacturing side. We've just mastered some IP on the process engineering side to build these products and then get them to some level of volume at a, at a price point that's pretty, uh, pretty eye-catching to the market. So you can have a temperature sensor. It's uh, it's a bit bigger than the postage stamp size, but uh, how big are your um, the battery-assisted pixels in this uh, um, printed battery product? We've, uh, I don't have the specs exactly in front of me, but we, we've put a basically a benchmark of the, uh, the pixels, uh, the passive tabs, and it's about two and a half of those tags together. So uh, slightly bigger, but not much bigger than than what's out. Roughly the size of a business card. So you postage stamp size if you're battery free, and business card, credit card size if you're uh, if you've got a battery on it. Right? Yeah, that that's a good benchmark. Uh, traditionally, a lot of these uh, loggers that were the size of a credit card, business cards, are maybe another two to three centimeters uh, smaller, and we're just just smaller, than that, which is nice. So when do you use one versus the other? People, because the same chip, uh, same encrypted payload, same temperature sensing. Yeah, uh, you know, why would I go up to something that's uh, just north of a dollar versus something that's uh, you know uh, um, double digit pennies? Um, what's uh, what's the motivation? What are these cases? Well, definitely, I would say starting point is definitely read distance uh, with, with the starting point. Uh, I think we're in this first phase of the controlled run. We're doing a pretty sterile result of over 20 meters. And I think these are be improving in the next gen. So that's because you're not constrained by the harvesting range. You can basically, you're really, so with battery powered, uh, sorry, battery free um IoT pixels, then you have at least two constraints. One is the read range, and the other one is the harvesting range. How far is the tag away from the energy source? So when you have a printed battery, then you've got rid of 50% of, of that, and it's just all about the transmit range, not about the harvesting range. So uh, that, that, that makes sense, uh, what you're saying about the range. Correct, exactly. And, and the nice thing is we've built it in a way, as you said, because it's printed, uh, when it gets embedded behind the label, you're really not hindering anything from a uh, performance standpoint. And also it doesn't uh, project out from that package. So you're getting the read distance, you're getting all those capabilities, but on surface level, you're not seeing any difference in what you're embedding, which is a value problem. So it seems to me that this is useful when you're going to the very outer limits of ambient IoT. I mean, the future of ambient IoT is we have all radios, whether they're in televisions, smart speakers, phones, or dedicated IoT devices can energize and read these tags, but we're not there yet. Uh, and so uh, you're not necessarily going to be near the kind of infrastructure that can power a battery-free tag. So you could put these 
bat tags on something that could be read by someone's phone in the middle of nowhere. It could be a convenience store in Guadalajara or Peru or wherever, um, uh, where you know there's just one or two tags and uh, and no one's thought to to put the uh, the um, the readers and so forth. So I, I feel like this is like a training run at the where ambient IoT is going to be in the future. What are the the main use cases that you're seeing drive um, interest in the battery free and the battery assisted products? What's uh, what would you see in terms of verticals and use cases? The cold chain definitely is one prominent one. So same same reason we we got into the accelerated route with the battery assisted pixels. Um, we see much more picking up within healthcare. We want to be writing the mandates around compliance on anything that's being transported, um, anything that has um, uh, requirements around uh, food safety. Uh, those are things that we want to ride, ride the requirements around. Um, we also want to find a way as the technology evolves, the read distances evolve, the hope is that these could start to compete with ultra wideband type ranges. And if they can, and then you have all of these scenarios that the products can speak to each other, you could potentially get into an environment that even on the retail side, it doesn't just focus on inventory management, but it becomes intelligent for retailers on habits of how products are interacting with each other, what shopper habits are. And then when also things get recycled or in between that process, they go to laundromats or they get lost, you can start to detect products. And then you can also get into many use cases based on a region you're in. So we see that this is going to start as a potential cold chain solution just because of the condition monitoring, but it can start to then evolve into a lot of intelligence um, in all the segments when it really starts to pick up and, and uh, uh, the read distance is really start to improve uh, much further than where we're at with the 20 meters. I think the other area that I would add to what you said is is grocery. Um, uh, well, retail in, ge- in general, but grocery in particular and, and quick service restaurants where that uh, ability to measure temperature at the case level is can it impact shelf life and food safety and product quality and freshness and uh, all of these things and where the the staffing is really under pressure and so having to have people wielding handheld scanners where you're, whether you're scanning barcodes or scanning uh, uh, RFID is problematic and you can uh, basically have Bluetooth devices that happen to be around that can be sensing rather than scanning. Um, I realized I've kind of, I've projected some of my biases and my opinions on where um, Bluetooth and ambient IoT fits relative to RFID. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I do want to ask you how you would explain to someone coming into this space, what is the sweet spot of NFC what is the speed, sweet spot of RAID RFID and what is the sweet spot of ambient IoT? Because, you know, my, and even though this is sponsored by William, my daytime employer, we feature all sorts of products from UHF, uh, RFID. So I, I, you know, my personal view is it's right tool, right job. It's not like, um, uh, the spanners are going to uh, eliminate the need for screwdrivers and the hammers. Uh, you know, you, you need you need uh, all of these things if you're if you're designing a solution. But I think people really get confused about when to use near field communication type stickers, when to use an RFID tag, or when to use a Bluetooth tag. And you've spent so much time in this world on all sides of the fence. How do you explain it to people? Yeah, and I, th- I think there's also another variable in this, and that's the technologies that require line of sight, like barcodes and QR codes. Oh, yes, that's true. So so you kind of have the whole, whole matrix in that environment. So so maybe I'll start with the, the less complex ones with barcodes and QR codes, the 1Ds and the 2Ds. Um, the obvious things are that all, all our mobile devices are outfitted right now with cameras. COVID has helped that. So you can read the QR codes in the uh, 
grocery example you had many other examples um with with items that go through logistics processes they all have barcodes now the upside is it's cheap it's easy downside is you have to have that line of sight and without always the perfect line of sight and the lighting and the environment you may miss things and it's always maybe a little bit of a time lapse till you recognize it and many cases uh it is the read distance as well with the camera or the reader to make sure you can interact with it when you get into the uhf environment you can in sterile environments get to 15 to 20 meters plus read ranges with a high-end reader and the perfect environment without metal or water collusion to read one to many and you read rather quickly and that's the value behind it you have the time timing of the readability to your advantage but you have to have that that de facto environment. And in many shop floors, especially in retail environments, you do have that. And you might have overhead readers or tunnels when products are moving in and out, so you can read them rather quickly. And you don't need that line of sight that you need with 1D or 2D uh, uh, printed technologies. Then uh, with HF and NFC, it's near field, high frequency uh, wavelengths. So you have to get very close to the products. Nice thing is most of the modern phones, I would say, I think the latest stat is around 98% of the phones have native readers and they've even unlocked write features. So you can interact with the text. So that rather than one to many is one to one. And you have higher end security being able to get that close to a product and then authenticate it, read it and get some level of consumer experience behind it. So one to one, uh, pretty quick. Uh, readability as well, but not as quick as what you get with UHF or even some of the uh, line of sight uh, technologies that are printed. And then you get into this exciting ambient space with uh, BLE technologies, which is one to many. And I'm classifying this as now one to many to many, because those objects that are all in the, in the field can interact with each other. And because they're harvesting and sending signals, they can, in a, I guess, a non-scary uh, way of explaining it, your products are living and breathing and they're speaking to each other. And when they summon back to a single source, you can get all of that information. Anything that's built in logic-wise can also speak to each other. And many times when I'm speaking through this, I, I touch on the Internet of Things topic, but really we were in an era of Internet of Devices for the longest time. And people were preaching Internet of Things, but the reality was the devices weren't mature enough yet to really support the Internet of Things. So we have went essentially from the launch of a mobile first world to a cloud first world supported by the mobile devices. And now we have all of these intelligent devices. So we are in the era of Internet of Things and to support how these products are speaking to each other. And then we get into then the alternate, which is then hopefully building a level of AI behind it because you have all this data and you got to do something and automate it. And with these BLE technologies, because it's one to many to many, you can now start to have the intelligence behind it. But what you may be sacrificing, you, you don't need the line of sight. It also is the speed of the read behind it. So I, I'm hoping as we evolve this technology in the space, we could start to read devices as quickly as we read them with Bluetooth low energy as you would read it with a traditional RAIN RFID UHF product. And if that can happen, you've really changed the game because we're, we're not only just doing reading of products, we're doing the condition monitoring. And if you go back down the matrix, HF, NFC, UHF, printed technologies with barcodes and QR codes, None of these give you the ability to have all of these capabilities in one. And if you want to have these capabilities, you have to upgrade the chipset. The nice thing is with the Ambient IoT, you're unlocking these feature sets from the cloud. The chip is ready to go and it has the capabilities. So you get enhanced capabilities, you get the condition monitoring, and with where the technology is building and how we're uh, really collaborating um, with, with experts like Williot and others, is that we are building the knowledge share that we can start to build the read ranges behind it, which is also something that these legacy technologies can't support. So you get the capabilities, you get the long read ranges, and then you, you're, you're off and running with in a world that all these products are digitized and now everything has a living and breathing heartbeat in the market. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of words of wisdom there. Uh, 
few things I would add is um, with barcodes and QR codes, um, the advantage is you know, it's the the cost. It's like the cost of ink, so it's almost free. Um, but the problem is you have to get someone to scan them, and uh, um, if it's a consumer, they're notorious at not doing that. Uh, you have to really give them a very good reason to to scan. Uh, if it's an employee, then you can tell them to scan, you can pay them to scan, but um, sometimes they forget, sometimes they make mistakes. And uh, the benefit of the ambient IoT and the battery piece is it's streaming data all the time uh, and you're, you're sensing rather than scanning. And so um, those devices are registering their presence, they're re registering their condition whether you do anything or not. And what I've found in life is if you're dependent on someone to do something, be prepared to be disappointed. If you want really Sorry. high compliance <laughs> and you want high conversion rate, then having something that's streaming the data out is, uh, is good. When I, I, I have been a big fan of NFC, and it's true that as a, uh, in, in America, we've, we've come you know, more recent converts than in Europe, but uh, um, now Apple Pay is and uh, Google Pay is ubiquitous. We've kind of learned to tap. And if you want a tap experience, in my opinion, NFC is second to none. And there are, you know, it may sound like I'm going back and contradicting myself because here I'm saying, oh, you have to do something. But sometimes you do want the consumer to do something. They, you want them to take an affirmative action and opt in a a registration, an indication that they want to pay, and you will get a robust, rapid transaction driven by NFC. And that's not true of, of BLE. BLE is really good at saying, oh, this thing's nearby, but it's 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 not a binary thing. It's a, it's a linear thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if you want a, a map and have people uh, tap on the map to select a, a location, Use an NFC sticker. If you want someone, if you want to know what inventory is nearby or um, a point of interest that's nearby, then use BLE. That's what I would say. Then I think it becomes a little more complex when you're comparing UHF and uh, traditional RAID RFID um, with with BLE. But in my mind, um, theoretically, there's not much difference, but practically, there's a huge amount of difference because BLE uh, readers. Uh, in some cases are free or certainly tens of dollars rather than hundreds of dollars and thousands of dollars. And the implication there is if I'm using BLE, I can afford to have readers everywhere. I think you said that already. Um, but the result is you're streaming the data and it's no labor, low labor. So ambient IoT, BLE, no labor, low labor. Whereas traditionally, at least with the handheld scanners with uh, uh, UHF RFID, you're relying on something doing some, someone doing something, and I trivialize it by saying it's like asking your kids to mark their own homework. It it works when they're doing it properly. It doesn't work when they're when they're not. Um, and because the scanners are expensive, you're effectively getting a snapshot. Whereas with Bluetooth, it's streaming the data, uh, and that's kind of a, I think, a simplistic way, uh, maybe, uh, of looking at it. And then in the future, you th you look at where things are going. So, I think it's great. Um, you you guys can provide people with whatever they want, whatever they believe. Uh, then uh, Identiv has uh, any of those technologies to hand, and I think uh, you are kind of unbiased and experienced in that respect. So. Any um, anything else that we should cover before we wrap up on your uh, second visit to, to Mr. Beacon? Anything you want to say about what uh, what your team is uh, working on at the moment? I'm just really excited to uh, to be here to openly speak to you about where the market's going, the excitement around ambient IoT. So it's a privilege, Steve. And from from our perspective, you know, we're we're happy to just be supporting the wave of these innovations. It's it's a nice place to be sitting in. Um, not to be just one dimensional, one technology, but to be able to go across the spectrum. And then um, with suppliers, it's it's nice because they start to push the boundaries and say, is this possible? And we get our hands on early stage capabilities and say, yes, it's possible. This is how you need to design it. And then we start to work towards the market. So 
being on the high end side on the specialty side is a, is a privilege and then also working with partners like Williot and, uh, and others it's 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 also great as well because we're pushing the boundaries yeah I again with my Williot hat on uh, you uh, and uh, uh, Stephen your CEO and the whole team at identive have been really amazing to work with you've really leaned into it you get it you see where it's going you're making the investment so uh, yeah that sounds sounds good so um one of the things that you mentioned when we spoke back in episode 120 gosh it seems like an eternity ago i wow. think we were still covid <laughs> was still going on then um you mentioned gentlemen of orange county i know you're super busy uh, with what you're doing at Identiv, um, are you still doing that? And 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 maybe you can just update us on what that is. I'm kind of interested in uh, uh, in that side of things. Yeah, I'm glad glad you brought it up. It's a different story than the uh, IoT world that we're playing in daily, but it's a nice uh, sideline hobby. Yeah, uh, it's it's a nonprofit that I've started with uh, three of my really good friends. And it's geared towards giving back to the youth in Orange County. So we all kind of took a subject matter that we're passionate about and uh, started to focus in on it. So whether it's educating and mentoring kids, giving them soft skills with a lot of the uh, computer programs, or if it's giving food drives uh, to the community, we do toy drives during the holidays. So we're pretty active, about two events per month. And uh, it's it's nice to be able to do something outside of the uh, the IoT world, but also give back and definitely give back to the youth and help them with their trajectory down the line. And is it just an informal thing, or do you have a website and so forth? We have a website, Gentlemen of OC, and it has uh, pictures and different things from our events. So it's it's very much active, and we have a social media site as well. So, Excellent. Yeah, I invite you to check it out. I definitely will. I encourage all our uh, listeners and viewers to to do the same. That's great. Definitely. Well, yeah, appreciate that, Amir. Um, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been uh, it's been a real treat having you on again. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's, it's good to reconnect on this topic uh, after so many years. And you're right; it was during COVID, so it's uh, it's nice to be working together and then uh, circle back to it again as well. Very good. All the best. Thanks for watching this episode of the Mr. Beacon Ambient IoT podcast here on YouTube. You can listen to this episode on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoyed it, please like and share this video. And be sure to subscribe for more videos. For more information about Williot, Ambient IoT, and IoT Pixels, head over to williot.com.